Okay, good evening everyone. It's a cold, it was a kind of a cold and windy day today. Yeah, and it's a cool night, so I like cold, because then I like to wear, I get to wear my sweaters and jackets, etc. Yep, I get to wear all my layers, so I like it. <laughs> okay, uh, let me get the Bible here. Tonight, if you notice in the lesson, we're talking about uh, the millennium. This is lesson 16. It looks like this, right? We're doing this one. Yes. Yep, the red one. Okay. And uh, so if you would open up your Bibles, I want to read a few verses from Revelation chapter 20. So this is just to refresh our memory on what we're going over tonight. Revelation chapter 20. And uh, the Bible begins with judgment. And the Bible ends with judgment because in the book of Genesis, um, the Bible in Genesis chapter three, the beginning of the, the chain of doom events and the entrance of sin, etc. God makes a judgment. He makes a judgment on Adam and Eve. Um, he makes a judgment on the devil that tempted them. And, um, and then the Bible ends with judgment in the book of Revelation, the last chapters specifically here in chapter 20, where there is what um, we call the great, white, the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, where everyone who has not been saved will be judged, uh, books will be opened. So let's start, um, I'm going to skip over some verses, but Revelation 20, verse 1 says that John saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? 1, for 1,000 years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the 1,000 years were finished. That indicates that there will be more deception after the 1,000 years. Now, this is all metaphorical language. The angel doesn't have a, you know, big chain that weighs, you know, 500,000 tons. <laughs> no, no literal chain can hold Satan back unless it were a divine chain made by God, but this is metaphorical language. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So during the time when Satan is bound uh, by circumstances, he can't deceive anybody anymore. Uh, meanwhile, the saints are alive they're with Christ, they're sitting on thrones, and they're reigning with Jesus for a thousand years. It says, but the rest of the dead. Now, the rest of the dead cannot refer to those who are saved, the saints, because they're all alive, and they're reigning with Christ for a thousand years. So this must refer to other people that will be in the second resurrection that Revelation 20 talks about. In other words, the lost. They did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And then it says, this is the first resurrection, referring to the saints that were resurrected with Christ at his second coming. Again, at the end of verse 6, they're priests and they will reign with him for a thousand years. However, the Bible says in verse 7, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released now you think, well, why would he be released? Why just a thousand years, which for a supernatural being like the devil is, I mean, it is a long time, but um, why just a thousand years? And why would God release him? And it says Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Well, it can't mean deceive the saved because the saved are already saved. They're with Christ. They're reigning with him as, as priests and, and judges for a thousand years. So the ones that Satan deceives are the nations, are the lost nations for everybody from, from every part of the globe. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Well, if you go to chapter 21, 
Um, we won't read it, but John says in verse 2 that he saw a holy city, holy city, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So that's the beloved city. But then verse 11 says uh, that John saw a great white throne and um, though him who sat on, sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. He says he saw the dead, great and small, everybody, all of the dead, were obviously resurrected before God. This is where it says the books were opened, the book of life was opened, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now when it says the dead, God is not going to judge a person who is dead. They can't hear anything. So these are the dead that had been resurrected, the lost. And we're going to go over more in detail uh, with, with, as the, when we open up the lesson. Verse 13 says, the dead, the sea gave up the dead, the, um, death and Hades, everybody. And they were judged, each one, one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the day death died. Death will be destroyed, which sounds kind of funny. Hades, the abode of the dead, will be destroyed. This is the second death. So the saved will not experience the second death, only the lost. They've just been judged according to their works, what was written in the books. And if their name is not in the book of life, they have no life. <coughs> And verse 15, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So what this verse is saying is that this lake of fire will be effective and do its work at the end of the thousand years at the great white throne judgment. So this lake of fire exists for uh, the lost and uh, the lost will be judged and placed into this lake after the thousand years. Okay, so that's sort of uh, just a summary of the lesson. So open up your lessons. And uh, we do have a quiz. Um, didn't pass out the, the cards here, but this is in um, regards to our previous meeting. Number one says, so just answer true or false according to, to oh, is this on, by the way, Beverly? Yes, it is. Okay, the pre-advent judgment, in other words, this is an ongoing judgment before the second coming of Christ, that's what that means, occurs after the reign of the little horn, according to Daniel 7, is that true or false? Number two, you want the cards? Maybe it'd be a bit easier for you to write it on, on the cards. Can you do me a favor, Rosa? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so let me go back to number one. The pre-advent judgment occurs after the reign of the little horn, according to Daniel 7. By the way, I hope you've been reading these chapters in Daniel on your own, because if you don't, then these lessons, these question and answer lessons, are just going to be too fast. Uh, they won't e actually make sense without reading. Okay, number two. When the judgment begins in heaven, no one on earth knows it's going on. When it begins in heaven, now think of the dates that we figured out in Daniel 8 and 9 in particular. No one on earth knows it's going on. True or false? Number three, the pre-advent judgment decides positively in favor of the saints, but negatively against the little horn power. Is that true or false? And then number four, the reason, want me to go back to three? Was that too quick? No? Okay. Number four, the reason God has a judgment is to find out what the angels have written in the books so he can decide who he's going to save. God has to look at these books and figure out, oh yeah, okay, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I love you, I love you not, I love you, I love you not. <laughs> Number five, the sanctuary message in the everlasting gospel is used by God to destroy the influence of the little horn power. The sanctuary message in the everlasting gospel is used by God to destroy the influence of little horn power. Okay, so let's go back to number one. This judgment going on before Christ comes back a second time, it occurs after the reign of the little horn, according to Daniel 7. Is that true or false? <clears throat> it is true. 
It is very, very true. It's after the little horn does his thing. Okay? Number two, when the judgment begins in heaven, no one on earth knows it's going on. Is that true or false? Uh, <laughs> It, yeah. Well, yeah, but the Lord gave us the prophecies of Daniel 7 through 9 um, so that we could know something is happening in heaven, okay? Number three, this pre-advent judgment decides positively in favor of the saints but negatively against the little horn power, what do you say? Oh, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, because Daniel 7... Um, it's, it's, it's a judgment and uh, God uh, will defeat this little horn power that speaks blasphemous words against him. The saints are handed over to him for a long time and um, God will judge in favor of the saints. Number four, the reason God has a judgment is to find out what the angels have written in the books so he can decide who he's going to say. What do you say? It's false. Of course it's false. God knows everything. Remember we said the other night, God doesn't need books. You know, if you read about these books and, and, and books and heavenly books and God even counts our tears, um, you, you think, why, why would God need a book? I mean, he is a book. He's the logos. He's the word. He knows everything. Um, so he doesn't need these books. Nevertheless, there are books. And the way I see it, it is for the sake of the, um, the angels, for the universe, those that don't have God's divine mind. There's only one divinity, and that's the Trinity. Um, sorry about that, I just heard my phone. Number five, the sanctuary message and the everlasting gospel is used by God to destroy the influence of the little horn power. What do you say? Okay, of course, that is true. That is true. We looked a lot at the sanctuary and the services and the three phases of Christ's judgment, judgment that are illustrated in the sanctuary. And um, the little horn power brings uh, God's sanctuary down um, according to uh, Daniel chapter uh, 8. And, um, but the gospel that is illustrated, sort of a sandbox, illustra sandbox illustration in the Old Testament, as long as we understand how salvation works, how we can be saved, which is illustrated beautifully in the Old Testament sanctuary system, um, that should lead us to right thinking and the right steps on how to approach Jesus, how we are saved by Jesus, etc. Okay. Today's lesson is the judgment continues. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 20, um, and we just read a few verses from there. Here is just a uh, quick uh, synopsis, the chart of the 2300 years we looked at uh, the other night. If you look at 457 BC, um, that is the, there were four decrees by the Persian kings, the one that seems to fit the most of Daniel chapter 9, the one that seems to be the most uh, th that has fulfilled that prophecy the best is the one in 457 B.C. by Artaxerxes. So there, that is the beginning. If you combine Daniel 8 and 9, the 2300 years has its beginning at the same time, or I should say the 490 year prophecy has its beginning at the same time of the 2300 year prophecy, and that was in 457 B.C. Here's the 490 years or the 70 weeks of Daniel which ends in 34 AD, the, re the remaining uh, amount of years brings us to the year 1844. Okay, so that's just a quick chart just to refresh our memories. Okay, so here's the three phases of the judgment. The pre-advent judgment is from 1844 until the second coming. Um, we don't know when it's going to end. We don't pretend to guess uh, when judgment is over, when Christ will come back. We're not trying to guess a year. What we do know, however, is that when the plagues, these seven bowls of God's wrath, the plagues are poured out on planet Earth, the reason why those plagues are poured out is because the sealing of the 144,000 has taken place. 
when that ceiling happens on here on earth and those 144,000 are, are, if we can say it this way, preserved or safe from those plagues, that means probation is up. And so once these plagues begin to hit planet earth, we have a good idea that, uh, you know, the end is really, really near. Um, it, satisfy, it satisfies the peoples of the entire universe, other worlds, and all the angels. We believe that planet Earth, um, it's, it's hard to believe that planet Earth is the only Earth that is inhabited by uh, God's creatures in the, his entire universe. And so that's why we put um, other worlds. The second phase is the judgment in heaven. It lasts for a thousand years. It satisfies all of the redeemed. This is when Christ, Christ comes back. Um, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. We'll look at that later tonight. All of the saved, the dead saved, and the alive saved are resurrected with Christ to meet him in the air, and they will reign with Christ for a thousand years in heaven. Now this is in contra to the popular belief that there will be a thousand years of peace on earth. We are saying in this seminar that that is in heaven and earth will be desolate. And we'll look at some of the verses tonight uh, that reveals that. And then the final judgment is after the thousand years. Sometimes we call this the executive judgment. Or as I said earlier, the great uh, white throne judgment. It takes place after the thousand years. This is Revelation 20 satisfies all of those who are lost, including Satan and his fallen angels. Now, I know it seems kind of strange, but if the wicked are slain at the second coming of Christ, the earth is desolate, full of, I hate to say it this way, but rotting bodies for a thousand years until there's just dust and bones. Um, but then there will be a resurrection and they will be judged. They will know why they were lost. Now, you know, if you and I were God, we'd probably say, well, they're dead. <laughs> they got what was coming to them. They were lost. But if you think about it, they were never, although the Spirit had been speaking to them, God had been speaking to them throughout their lives, we don't believe that there's a second chance. After death, that's it. But God is merciful enough and just enough to raise them and tell them, this is why you were lost. This is why you were lost. And then comes that lake of fire. Okay? This is our uh, scenario. This is our eschatology, understanding of eschatology in the Bible. Okay, so let's go to the lesson. When will the judgment begin? According to Daniel 8.14, it will begin at the end of the 2300-day prophecy, or taking a day for a year, uh, 2300 years this is Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 or it'll it'll uh, take place at, in 1844 okay so you have those two phrases there to fill in the blanks I know you can barely see it here but 2300 and 1844 okay the second question says since judgment begins at the house of God in other words uh, those who claim to know God um, with whom does it end? With whom does it end? If it begins at us, what shall be at the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? This judgment begins with the saved. Eventually it will end, the last judgment, with the unsaved. And this seems to fit Revelation 20, right? At the great white throne judgment, that great final executive judgment ends with the unsaved, with the lost, those who did not obey the gospel of God. Question number three says, who will be involved in the judgment of the wicked? Now this is what Paul says to the Corinthians. I'm personally in the book of Corinthians in my devotions. Who will be involved in the judgment of the wicked? This is what Paul says. The saints shall judge the world, and he says, that we shall even judge angels. Now, obviously, this doesn't refer to holy angels. They need no judging. They didn't fall. This refers to the third of the angels uh, that uh, Satan had deceived, that war in heaven as described in Revelation chapter 12. Now, I don't think that Paul, when he's writing this to the Corinthians, I don't think he's saying, he's describing something that's going to take place in their lifetime. In other words, here on earth. 
Because the saints don't judge the world in the sense who is saved, who is not. not only, only Christ does that. But Christ will give us the privilege to be sort of co-judges, assistant judges during this thousand years. That can't take place right now. Plus, judging angels. I know I'm not judging the fallen angels. <laughs> I don't have that information. I don't have that capacity. But during the thousand years, when we are glorified and we receive the new bodies and we are changed in the twinkling of an eye, as Paul says in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, um, we will take that on that role, that function, as judges and priests with God during the thousand years. Number four. When do the saints engage in judgment? Now, we read this just a little bit ago in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. The Bible says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. If I am saved by God's grace, God will give me judgment. Not judging me. Why was he going to judge me? I'm already saved and I'm in heaven. So he's going to give me the privilege of judging. And matching this with Paul's statement, I and you, by God's grace, will be able to judge the fallen and even angels. Judgment was given unto them. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. A thousand years. Now this is in heaven. This is in heaven. And by the way, you heard me say, I believe, uh, a few nights ago, after the thousand years are up, the city, New Jerusalem, descends lands on earth, in the Mount of Olives area in Palestine, and this will be our final resting place. God will make his habitation with us. He will dwell with us. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. We will dwell with him. He'll dwell with us. And earth will be made new, new heavens and a new earth, Peter says himself, 1 Peter chapter 3. And so we'll, we'll live here. So a thousand years in heaven really is nothing in the scope of eternity, right? It really is hardly anything. Okay? All right. So um, let's look at what's going to take place at the beginning of the thousand years. By the way, I gave one of our, uh, I gave Carlos just a quick diagram of the millennium. Did I make copies for everybody of, of the events that take place before, during, and or the beginning, during, and at the end of the millennium? No? I must give him just a copy. I'll, um, I'll make some copies. So it brings all of this very nicely with the scriptures and everything. Okay, let's look at the beginning of the thousand years. What event marks the beginning of the thousand years according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6? What event marks the beginning? It is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is described in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Christ will come with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and what does it say? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which remain and are alive will be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, that is the first resurrection. We want to be part of the first resurrection. That's if Christ doesn't come before we die. We want to be part of this first resurrection, okay? Question number six asks, is this a resurrection of the righteous or the wicked? Well, I just answer that. It's the resurrection of whom? Of the righteous, yep. The dead in Christ. He doesn't just say the dead. Paul says the dead in Christ will rise first. Obviously, that means that we, those dead, died having a covenant relationship with, uh, with Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay. Now, question number seven says, if there is a first resurrection, then there must also be what? A second one. When does this second resurrection take place? According to verse five, the Bible says the rest of the dead. This has to be by, by logic and by uh, just deduction and reasoning these, putting all these verses and events together, this must refer to the wicked dead. They were never resurrected at the second coming of Christ. So the, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. That is the second resurrection. That is the second one. How many resurrections did Jesus talk about? He said it himself in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. 
First one is there's a resurrection of life. This is what he said in John. And then, of course, there's a resurrection of damnation. Now, what Jesus doesn't say, this is why you have to bring all of these verses together and synchronize them. What he doesn't say is, how far apart are these two? Are they immediately together? Um, but if you take Revelation 20 in the, in the judgment uh, scene and those verses, etc., there are those two resurrections, but they're separated from each other by quite a distance, a thousand years to be exact. Question number nine, when does the first resurrection occur? Well, I'm answering all of these before I even come to them. <laughs> the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So that the second coming of Christ marks the beginning of these thousand years. In fact, Revelation 19 talks about the second coming of Christ. Then you come to Revelation chapter 20 and it's talking about the thousand years. Okay. All right. Question number 10 in your lesson. Any questions or comments, by the way? No? We're going fast, aren't we? I know. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh-huh. There's the resurrection of life, and letter B is the resurrection of damnation. And Jesus himself said that. Okay? So there's two of them. All right. So uh, question number 10 asks, what happened? I'll, I'll try and go a little slower. What happens to the righteous who are alive when Jesus comes, what happens to the righteous who are alive when Jesus comes? And that's in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And the scripture there is on your screen with the words that you need to fill in the blanks. These. I know it's hard to see. We, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? Yes, it is important. You know, this is interesting because the reason why Paul is writing this is because there were some Corinthians that evidently uh, were concerned about their loved ones who fell asleep. In other words, who died. Asleep is, is that uh, term that is used as a synonym for death. And... Um, you know, 1 Corinthians probably was not Paul's first letter. There's evidence that there's enough evidence, internal evidence in the book of 1 Corinthians that Paul probably wrote four letters to the Corinthians. Yes. And the Corinthians had written Paul before the letter that we read in 1 Corinthians. Yeah. So, for example, Paul would say, now the matters that you wrote to me about. He'll say this a couple of times in 1 Corinthians. So we don't have that letter that the Corinthians wrote to Paul asking him some questions. But Paul is talking about this in response to what they wrote about those who uh, fell asleep. Apparently, there were some people there that were concerned. Well, you know, if, if they died and, you know, many of the first century Christians believe that Jesus was going to return in their day. And so, you know, if my grandpa died you know, or my, you know, my, my dad just died a couple of years ago. And if Jesus comes back, you know, next week, what's going to happen to him? You know, I mean, are, is he going to be left behind or what's going to happen? Paul says, no need to worry. Because when Christ comes back, the first thing he's going to do is resurrect your grandpa and your dad. <laughs> That's the first thing he's going to do. Before you even start floating up to heaven, wee! He says, not yet. He's going to resurrect your dead loved ones who died with a covenant relationship with God. He's going to resurrect, resurrect them first. And then those of you who are alive will all go together. It's going to be one big happy family. Nobody's going to precede anybody else. It's going to be all at the same time. So I can just, you know, when those Corinthians finally receive that letter by the, the, the mailman and they're reading this in the church, Oh, that's good. Thank you, Paul, for, for that. That really comforts us. Okay, so that's what's going on. Question 11. Where does Jesus take the righteous dead and the righteous living? Now, this is where a lot of different verses come together. We've got to get all of the biblical evidence. 
And this is what John is telling his disciples, John chapter 14. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again, and while we're cutting the verse, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. So when Christ comes again, he's going to take us, those who believe in him and have faith in him, with him so that we can be with him where he is. So what that is saying is that at the second coming, we're taking off up to heaven. We're going up. We're going up along with those who died in Christ. Amen? That's good news. Okay. So I'm trying to go a little bit slower and not get too excited. <laughs> okay. So again, all these verses are coming together. What happens to the wicked when Jesus comes again? What happens to the wicked? While you answer that, I'm going to take a little drink of water here. What happens to the wicked when Jesus comes? Boy, you're good students. Okay. According to 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, he shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. I actually want us to read that verse. So let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians. And let's go to chapter 2. And I want you to see this because it's talking about the lawless one. Um, interesting language here. Let's look at verse 5. Do you not remember 2 Thessalonians? It's in the Pew Bible. It's on page 1138. Page 1138 in the Pew Bible. Okay, verse 5. Do you not remember chapter 2? That when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. In Paul's day it was. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming, listen to verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. So at the end of verse 8, it says, Jesus, the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That word coming, that last word in verse 8 is parousia in Greek, coming or appearance. And in verse 9, it says, the coming of the lawless one. It's using the same word, parousia, appearance. The same word is used for the coming of Christ. The coming of the lawless one, listen to this, is, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. What's interesting is the book of Acts says that Jesus' ministry was accompanied by, accompanied by um, uh, wonders and miracles and signs. Well, here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you have the coming of the lawless one, sort of a fake parousia. Same thing, with miracles, signs, and wonders, lying wonders. But when Christ, the real second coming, happens, he's going to destroy that lawless one with the brightness of his coming. Now it goes... I know this is a deduction here, but if Christ is going to destroy this lawless one, then I would say more than likely he's going to destroy all of the wicked at his second coming, not just the lawless one. But what's interesting is when this lawless one comes, it's going to be very tricky. That's why Jesus says uh, he will cut the day short because the, even the very elect would be deceived if it were possible. This second coming, or this coming, excuse me, of the lawless one is going to be wonderful, convincing, persuasive, powerful, glorious. Now, I believe it'll come short of the real thing of Christ's coming. Otherwise, we would not be able to tell the difference. But it's going to be 
a very, very deceptive and dangerous. And that's why he said that we'll meet Jesus in the air. That's why we'll meet Jesus in the air. That's why Jesus says, if somebody says, look, look, Jesus is out there in the desert place or in the rooms or he's out there someplace. Jesus says, do not go out. He not only says, don't believe it, but he says, don't even go because of this deceptive power. So it's, uh, so he'll destroy. Okay, question number 13. How bright will the second coming of Christ be? For those of you who like to do with a studio lighting, it'll probably be one million lumens. <laughs> it'll be a lot brighter than that. Brighter than the sun. Okay, how bright. It says, the verse says, the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. When Christ rose from the dead, one lone angel opened the tomb, and at this angel's appearance, the Roman guards fell as dead men. At one angel. So when Christ returns, he will come in his own glory, plus the glory of all the holy angels. No wonder the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. It's going to be like, it's going to, you know, outdo the sun a thousand times. Of course, those who are saved will be able to take it. Okay. They say that heaven will be totally emptied. Where's God? Yeah, uh, so she's asking that uh, it's said that heaven will be totally emptied. Where is God? Well, you know, when it's talking about the second coming, it's talking about Christ coming with, the, with all of his angels. And Christ will send the angels to the four corners of the earth to gather the elect, you know, et cetera. The dead will be raised, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, I can't think of a verse right now where it says, the Father will be in heaven alone, waiting on his big throne, and, you know, and he'll be all alone. <laughs> I can't imagine the Heavenly Father will not want to see this event. <laughs> Yes, the Father, the, yes, God is everywhere at all times. Um, but at the second, so she's saying that God is everywhere at all times. Yeah. The Holy Spirit, yeah. He's, so he, he is present everywhere through his Holy Spirit because Jesus said that. Um, it's, it's better for you that I leave because if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit won't come to you. So um, we have his presence, the Father, the Son, through the Holy Spirit. But um, Christ is the only one that has still human flesh, glorified human flesh, but nevertheless flesh. But I can't see any member of the Trinity staying back and, you know, hanging balloons and, you know, and the streamers for the big party, you know, or just, you know, I'll wait here and I'll keep the doors. <laughs> I think just, it's going to, I think it's going to be emptied. For this great event yeah so okay so let's go to question number good question question number 14 how does the prophet Jeremiah describe the destruction of the wicked at the second coming of Christ so Jeremiah has these uh, visions now Jeremiah way at the beginning I shared with you the difference between and you probably won't remember so I'll, I'll give you a refresher the difference between classical prophecy and apocalyptic prophecy, or foretelling and forthtelling. Okay? So, classical prophecy generally is prophecies that are contemporaneous with the prophet's own day. They're instructions that are relevant for their time and their place right there. Okay? It's contemporary. That's classical prophecy. There may be predictions here and there. That's, that may be true. But by and large, classical prophecy has to do with um, the prophet saying, you know, um, do this or don't, don't do that for their day. And many times God will act or respond according to how the people respond. In other words, sometimes those prophecies in classical prophecy are conditional. Classic example is Jonah, right? Yeah. Jonah's was a prophecy 
for his day and age. If you guys don't behave yourself, God's going to destroy this Nineveh in 40 days. Well, what happened? They repented, right? And God withheld his hand. That was conditional prophecy. In apocalyptic prophecy, it's characterized by symbols. It's characterized by things that are going to happen way in the future of the prophet's day, towards the end of time. And it's characterized by um, the fact that these things are going to happen. They're not conditional. This is going to happen. Classical prophecy is sort of like what, what could be. If you repent, this could be. God will prosper you. Apocalyptic prophecy is what will be. There is no conditions. That's by and large. Jeremiah at times may have visions in Isaiah of the future glory of Israel or of heaven, etc. In other words, these things are going to happen because it's way in the future. And here's a sample. How does the prophet Jeremiah describe the destruction of the wicked at the second coming of Christ? And this is what he says. The slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be, what? Lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. That, now it's a horrible scene. Have you seen those uh, horrific videos and pictures of the Holocaust? The uh, concentration camps and you know, the, the piles of bodies in these mass pits. You know, it's just, it's horrible even to think of those things. Um, you and I were meant to, went to see uh, uh, Hearst Berger, the Holocaust survivor at the Paradise Valley Church. Well, didn't you say you went too? Yes. Yes, and she showed some of those pictures. I got one of her books. She signed it. It was really interesting. And you were there too? Yeah. yeah. She showed some of those things on there. It was horrible. But you can just imagine the condition of the earth. Christ comes back. Dead and alive in Christ, go up with him, go up to heaven for a thousand years. Earth is desolate. The wicked were slain by the brightness of his coming. Satan is still alive, but he's bound and chained by circumstances. There's no one to deceive. Who is he going to deceive? He can't go anywhere. He is locked in this abyss because the earth will have that abysmal character to it. It will have that abyss-like character to it. Chaotic, void, nothing. Just imagine the destruction of the seven plagues that did to planet Earth. It's, it's going to be horrible. It's like going back to the way the Earth was before God actually brought some order and beauty to it. Okay, now let's go. Let's go to. Let's see the events. Uh, the events during the thousand years. We are looking at the beginning of the thousand years. Now, during the thousand years. Now, look at the graph on the screen. Pretty pictures up there. So the saints are in heaven judging the wicked for a thousand years. Sometimes you'll hear, um, again, God has no need for books. He has no need for books. His, his knowledge is perfect. Those books are for our privilege and angels to look into it and see the things that were written. The book of memories the book of deeds, everything that was uh, this particular book of Joe Smith. Um, everything, down to his very intense and hidden motives and his thoughts. Uh, everything is in this book. And we may ask, we thought Joe Smith was going to make it for sure. I mean, this was, this, we thought he was going to make it for sure. But we just don't know. The opposite is true. There may be people that we deem, you know what, there's, there's no way. I mean, this is a lost, this is a basket case, a lost cause for all a human appearances. We just don't know what's going on in a person's mind and heart. We don't know. We just don't know. But they're all written in very uh, minute exactness. And so we'll have the privilege to be judges and look at this stuff and see why God made the decisions he made to save, or, or excuse me, not to save. 
That's what will be going on in heaven. The events during the thousand years, here's the first resurrection of the saints. On earth there's desolation, Satan is bound. We saw this in Revelation 20 in Jeremiah. Um, so these are the events during the millennium. Okay, so we have the first resurrection, the second coming, the righteous dead are raised, righteous living are translated and are, you know, flown up together. All righteous go to heaven. The wicked are slain by the second advent as well as the lawless one and the wicked dead stay dead and Satan is bound. The wicked dead stay dead. Now, at the second resurrection, the wicked are raised. Righteous descend to earth. And this, this slide is actually going ahead of the lesson. Um, the wicked attack the holy city. Number four, God vindicated before the wicked. The wicked are thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death, the Bible says. And the new heaven and earth are created. Okay? So let's go to number 15. Question 15. What happens to Satan during the thousand years? In Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2, Satan is what? He's bound or chained for a thousand years. Now, again, this doesn't mean that God takes a rope and places it around Satan. He's bound by the chain of his new situation, of his circumstances. There's nothing to do. Have you ever been so bored that it's horrible? I rarely get bored. In fact, I don't remember the last time I was bored. <laughs> um, but, you know, to be bored is, you know. And what's he going to do for a thousand years? What's he going to do? His, his activity and his work is taken away from him because he's a deceiver. That's his, that's his craft. He's a deceiver. But he can't do anything. All he's going to do is look around and this is all my fault. <laughs> yeah, you would. He said, yeah, you're saying that you would think Satan would have a change of heart. Well, I think Satan had that chance years ago, a long time ago. Yeah. No, he, he's a lost cause. I mean, he... Well, it says that he goes to war one last time, so he's probably that thousand years just getting angry and angry. Yeah, that's a good point. Rose says that, um, um, that he goes to war after the thousand years. So during the, the thousand years, she says he's probably just getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And, and he's no doubt plotting, even though he knows the end of the story, it's right here. Satan knows how to read. <laughs> it's written right here. So he knows this is true, and yet he's going to try and overtake it anyways because what the prophecy says, although he knows he's going to lose. And um, so, you know, we would say that's idiotic, but uh, just uh, take that with a grain of salt because remember, Satan is very cunning and smart. Uh, let's not ever take the devil to be dumb. Um, he, yeah, that's, that's insanity. That is insanity. But we still have to be on our guard against his wiles. We still have to be on guard. Yeah, the evil angels. She's saying the evil angels, um, you know, the Bible doesn't say that the evil angels are destroyed at the second coming. So, you know, we, we presume that the, the demons are also alive during the thousand years. Okay, why is Satan bound according to verse 3 of Revelation 20? Why? The Bible says, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled, which means he will deceive after the thousand years. So that's why he is bound, so that he should, excuse me, deceive the nations no more. Okay, number 17 asks, how does Jeremiah describe the earth during the thousand years? We saw this. Let's look at it. The earth was without form and void. Now, what does that remind you of? Creation. Genesis 1.1. The earth was without form and void. The heavens had no light. There was no man. 
The fruitful place was a wilderness. The cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord. This is a horrible place. Uh, think of the most horrible place you've ever been and multiply that by a thousand times. I mean, it's just, it's bad. It's, it's, it's going to be depressing, dark, gloomy, um, hellish, just horrible. It's a horrible place. Horrible, horrible. And this is was going to be his dwelling place in this type of wilderness. Okay, question 18 asks, what are the righteous doing in heaven during the thousand years? What are they doing? Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw thrones and they sat upon them and what? Judgment. judgment. And judgment was given unto them. Judgment was given to them. Now that judgment only God could give. God is giving them judgment. We're going to be like, uh, oh, what's that judge's name? That famous judge, that really tough female judge on TV. Judy, Judy Judge Judy. <laughs> We're going to be like Judge Judy. You know, not tough and, you know, uh, I'm not saying she's not a bad person. That's not what I'm saying, but we will go over these things and, and check it all out. Okay. All right. Question number... Uh, oh, sorry. So we're in the next section, events at the end of the thousand years. This is where it gets interesting. This is where it gets dramatic. What happens at the end of the thousand years, according to Revelation 20 and verse 7? Satan shall be what? Loosed. He's going to be let go. Now, the only one that can loose Satan is the power of God. It's not that Satan broke the chain. <laughs> He's loosed deliberately by God himself. Okay. And then what happens to the wicked at the end of the thousand years? The Bible says they are resurrected by inference. Okay. Because it says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. All right. So it doesn't say literally in these words, they are resurrected, but we know they are because they're judged. All of a sudden they're judged. Everybody's in front and the books are open and they're judged. And then they're thrown into the lake of fire. Well, if they have been dead for a thousand years and they're just bones and ash, then is God judging the bones and then the bones are collected and thrown into the lake of fire? That's, that's not the picture. So evidently they are resurrected to receive and to know why um, they did not make it. And of course, as we all say, for them, when death comes and they're resurrected, it's like, oh, what happened? She's like a few seconds. We always say that, right? When we die, and uh, we die in Christ, and the Lord resurrects us, we have no concept of how much time had passed since we breathed our last. There's, we have no concept. It's the same thing for them. When they resurrect, they're going to be resurrected with their same old bodies, with their same mindsets, and maybe they'll remember, oh yeah, when, I, the last thing I remember, I was driving... Well, the last thing I remember, I was at a party, you know, and, you know, an overdose or something. They'll, they'll, they probably remember the, the last things. They'll be resurrected as they are, not with glorified bodies like the saints are. And so they may still have in their minds, whoa, and they look at the earth and then they see the new city and the, the saints in the new Jerusalem descending. And it's like, this is crazy. The Christians were right. What is going on? And then, of course... Satan as general, I'm kind of jumping ahead, will gather them together and deceive the nations, the Bible says, to try and take over the new Jerusalem that's descending from heaven. Watch this. Number 21. What city does God bring to the earth at the end of the thousand years? Verse 2 in chapter 22. The new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. Jerusalem is always... I left my heart in Jerusalem. <laughs> God loves Jerusalem. <laughs> He's always had a heart for Jerusalem, right? And uh, I guess God likes that name. And it's going to be called the New Jerusalem, except who's the architect? It's God himself. God himself builds the city. It's going to be absolutely stunning. You ought to read the measurements of this city square it's it's crazy it's crazy all right question number 22 states 
where will Christ and the holy city land on the earth at the end of the thousand years, according to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4? The Bible says it will land on the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives, it'll split, create a huge valley. I mean, it has to because of the size of the city. You know, it's, this is going to be monumental. This is going to be tectonic plates moving like we've never seen before. What was that? It won't be apartments. It won't be apartments. It's going to be a beautiful city. It's going to be a gorgeous city. You know, streets of gold, precious stones. The, I, I like to think of the luxurious landscaping. I mean, the trees and the flowers and the bushes and, and the way God is designed. He's a master landscaper. You know, with the right colors and the right shades of green and the right vegetation and sizes. I mean, it's just going to be gorgeous, gorgeous. And a river running through it. You had a question or comment? Yeah, that's what they say around in that area. I don't know. Um, they do say that Eden was in that Mesopotamian area, you know around Iraq or Iran area, around that, uh, that, that side. Nobody really knows for sure. Um, but we know for sure that this is, Earth will be Eden restored. It's going to be beautiful. All right, question number 23. We're winding down here. Why does Christ come back with all his saints? Jude 14 and 15 answers this question. The Lord cometh when t with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all. So when Christ comes back to earth, he will bring his saints with him at the end of that 1,000 period um, with the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, because New Jerusalem is also coming down out of, out of heaven. It's going to be amazing. Number 24, what does Satan do to the wicked? Take a wild guess. Yeah, he's going to gather them all together to deceive them. He's going to deceive them, right? Why would they be deceived? Because they never changed. They, they've never changed. And so they're deceivable. They're, they're so vulnerable to Satan's uh, manipulation and attacks and deception. They're vulnerable as they were on earth before the thousand years when they died. Or, or and even way before. Cain himself. You know, Cain is going to be there and, you know, he's going to see, whoa, I never realized earth would look like this. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Cain saw the beauty of the earth before pre-flood. And some of those uh, antediluvians that preceded the flood, they're going to look at planet earth and the judgment. They're going to just like, this is crazy. You know, what happened? <laughs> and of course, they'll see that they're going to be judged. So, but Satan will go out to deceive the nations, the Bible says. As the wicked come up and surround the holy city, what happens to them according to Revelation 20 and verse 9? What happens to them? The Bible says, fire came down. Now, this is after they're judged. The books are open. The sea gave up their dead, etc. This is after they're judged. Fire came down from God out of heaven and what? Devoured them. What does the word devour mean? It's where no more. It's destroyed. Um, destruction. Fire came down from God out of heaven. Now, this is curious because, let's go back to the Bible, Revelation 20. Okay. So, let's look at verse uh, 9. Verse 7 says, when the thousand years expired, Satan will go out and deceive, etc. Verse 9, they went upon the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. But if you jump to 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great. So, just as a reminder, 
If you read Revelation, these verses, chapter 20, in chronological order, you'll go nuts. You'll go crazy. Because I thought they were devoured with fire. And now they're being judged before their great white throne. Remember, the Bible is often written with a, well, it is written with a, a Jewish mindset that it is written in chunks of themes, what is important, not necessarily chronological order. They didn't really, that wasn't an emphasis in, in, in Jewish thought, chronological order like it is in our Western uh, culture. So, um, and then, of course, it says, verse 14, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is interesting. If you combine these verses, you have fire coming down out of heaven from God to devour them. And then you have a lake of fire. Which one is it? Which one is it? Will they be destroyed by the fire coming down out of heaven from God to devour them? Or will they be destroyed by being thrown into the lake of fire? I kind of think it's both. <laughs> I mean, that's the good choice to make, right? Because both are mentioned. Um, Oh, we'll, we'll see that fire. I mean, we're there. We're there because we're the judges. Remember, we did the judging in the thousand years, but I think what's going to happen is God is the, the great judge, obviously. He's given all judgment to Christ, his son, actually, and he will be the speaker, you know. Um, but the thousand years is for our satisfaction, for everybody's. You know what? God, you're right. I know now why my grandpa didn't make it. You're right. You made the right choice. What God is concerned about is vindicating his name, his character, and his actions. In our, our, it's not because he, he's conceited and he's narcissistic. No. He is concerned about that for, our, for his own sake. He does not want his name to be stained. He wants to be cleared, but he wants to make sure that you and I understand and that we come to agreement with him so that there won't be opportunities in a second rising of sin in the future because we know the great horrible experiment of sin has been tried and it failed miserably and it cost literally millions and millions of lives. And of course, the Son of God, he's human just like us. It cost him his son and his nature is forever changed, although they do it again. <laughs> the Trinity, they'll do it again. You know, we've often heard sometimes that if there was the only one person among billions that would repent, Jesus would die still for that one person. That's how much he loves us. Okay, number 26 what do the wicked see inside the city? What do they see in the city? Revelation 20, verse 11. Sorry, wait. A great white throne and him that sat on it. That's what they see. And then 27 asks, was there any place found for the wicked as they stood before the great white throne? The Bible says no. There was found no place for them in the city. Because Revelation 20, uh, 22 Jesus himself, if you have a red letter edition, he says, and outside are the sorcerers, the dogs, those who practice witchcraft, the sexually immoral, all of the unsaved, uh, unregenerated, not born again, uh, lost people, they will be outside. There's no place inside for them. There's no way you can go in. The only way to go in, what did Jesus say? I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, they didn't go through the way, the truth, and the life, so there's no place in there for them, obviously. Question number 28. This is sad, though. You think about it. It's not a matter to rejoice in, yes, an us versus them attitude. Us meaning the saved and them meaning the lost. We don't adopt that attitude. That attitude is too prevalent in, in Christianity. We are to pain and labor and love those who don't have this message, not force it down their throats, but we share it lovingly and kindly by doing works of service, meeting their felt needs as best as we can, um, portraying Christ in a positive light, appealing, not repulsive, <laughs> and not threatening them with hell. No, 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 that's not the way it's done. Jesus didn't do it that way. 
So this is, this is actually a sad moment. It's not a moment that heaven will rejoice. Yes! Look at them burn! No. It's, it's, a, it's God's strange act of destruction. And it's, it's, it's going to be a... Yeah. It's a sad day. It is a victorious day, yes. I don't think we're going to have the emotion like, yes! We'll say like, oh man, if only it was different. But God, you did all you could. You did all you could. Number 28. What were opened as those who had been dead now stood before God? You know what it was, right? You know what it is? The books. The books were opened. And then what happens next to the wicked in verses 12 and 13? They were judged out of those things that were written in the books, right? How does the Supreme Court judge cases by the Constitution? How do we judge laws? Well, there's a written law someplace, whether it's Arizona law or the Constitution or what have you. There has to be a law to go by. And so um, these things, God's law is the great um, uh, arbiter be between right and wrong. And everything written in the books is going to be compared according to God's law. They did not actuate the grace of Jesus in their lives through faith. And so now, as opposed to them receiving mercy and grace by Jesus when they had the chance, guess what's going to happen? There is no mercy and grace. It's all law and judgment. That's scary. It's all law. And all of their deeds are written there permanently because they never repented. And it will be compared according to the great uh, lawgiver, his law. They were judged out of those things that were written in the books. Number 30, we have uh, three more. What happens to the wicked after they are judged? They were cast into the lake of fire, is what the Bible says. He doesn't arbitrarily destroy the wicked. The whole purpose of their being resurrected at the end of the thousand years is to prove to everyone without a doubt that God has given the wicked every opportunity to be saved but they have rejected every offer of salvation by God. Again, we just don't know how God is speaking to their heart. So we have to be careful not to be judgmental. You know, we may have what I'll call insider information. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We understand about faith in Christ and his grace that saves us. We understand that. We understand that his law is still binding, that we obey his law because we have been saved, because we love God. We understand these things. There's a lot of people that don't understand these things. So we can't come down and hard expecting them as you expect a little, you know, five-month-old baby to get up and walk. I want you to run to the store and go buy some things. <laughs> change yourself. Change your own diaper. Feed yourself. I'm tired. I don't want to cook for you. <laughs> you don't talk like that. And so we have to be careful not to have a judgmental attitude, but to have an attitude of love, and concern and remember that they're people God created them and he loves them and he died for people he died for people we, we are to do our part and the last question the second to the last will the wicked then acknowledge that God is truly the Lord well in a sense yes in a sense no the Bible says every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord now, if I'm, if I'm caught uh, speeding, if I'm caught speeding, and I know I was speeding, then I can tell the police officer, yes, police officer, I was speeding, right? But if the police officer wasn't around and I keep speeding, would I still confess, I'm speeding, I feel so bad about it, uh, you know, well, I slow down. There's a difference between confessing the rightness or the truth of something by me, the mere force of the truth. You have no other option. There's an other type of confession where it is an expression of your remorse and guilt and you feel bad about it. This is not the latter. This is the former. <laughs> okay. And last question tonight. Those who invite Jesus to handle their case now can be inside the city at the end of a thousand years. Do you desire to be inside, inside the city with Jesus? Amen? 
I do. I really want to be in there. And there's a lot of people that are wondering about God's stuff. And is God real? Is heaven real? Um, that's why Jesus says, go. We got to talk to people and be a little bit more bolder. Not aggressive and rude, but a little bit bolder. And uh, more confident in the Jesus. You may feel awkward. We may feel awkward in testifying about Jesus. I know, and we, you know, but that's a good thing, actually. It's a good thing. Because then you'll have to really trust in God for things. And still after, you may feel like a dope. But, uh, but Jesus can use us. Amen? Okay, if it is your desire to be safe inside the city with Jesus, raise your hands. Yes. Number two, if there is some problem in your life that you know can keep you from entering the holy city and you would like prayer that God will help you yield that problem to Jesus, then write it on that card, that quiz card, and just put it up here at the end. Okay? All right, so the next lesson is not this one. I have the next lesson for you. So we are skipping some. We're skipping a number of them. Because um, this, uh, this lesson set has a lot of lessons, but we only have 20 sessions. So this lesson here is for, what's today? Wednesday. So Rose, can you? Yeah, so this is for Wednesday. We're going to go into Daniel chapter uh, 10 and 11, and this one is entitled The King of the North, okay? The King of the North, those, uh, that amazing prophecy in, uh, in Daniel. These, are, these prophecies have pr uh, more detail, minute detail, than any of the prophecies in Daniel, actually. So we're going to look at those. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Yes, Rose. In chapter 20 of Revelation, in verse 10, uh -huh. um, when the devil's cast into the lake of fire, right. it's, it's saying that the beast and the, and the false prophet. Okay, let's look at Revelation 20 and verse 10. It says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Rose's question is, who is the false prophet? We have to go to Revelation 19 for that. So look at, um, let's see, it is, I'm reading here really quick. Sometimes I forget my verses, only the chapters. Okay, look at verse 20. This is uh, Revelation 19 and verse 20. So this is uh, when Jesus comes back and on his thigh is written, uh, Lord of, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And verse 20 says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Okay, so if you go to Revelation 13, you will see that the false prophet is the beast that comes out of the earth. So keep your finger at Revelation 19, verse 20, and go to Revelation chapter 13, and look at verse, uh, let's see, we'll start verse 12. Now this is the beast that comes out of the earth. Verse 12, Revelation 13, verse 12. And he exercises, this is the beast, the earth beast, all the authority of the first beast, the sea beast, in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound, wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. For some reason, I'm tongue-tied tonight. So if you go back to verse 20 in Revelation 19, it says, The false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So the false prophet is the beast that rises out of the earth. It's synonymous. So the sea beast and the false prophet slash earth beast 
Those are the two that are referred to in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, that are thrown into the lake of fire. So the false prophet is the earth beast. Now, in our, in our remember our final empire seminar, who did we identify as the earth beast? The earth beast. What country did we say who the earth beast was? The U.S. of A. The U.S. of A. So if that is true, then this false prophet is the U.S. of A. Logically. But I thought it was always the false prophets were the ministers and the leaders. Of, well, that's true. Of the uh, Sunday people, you know, <coughs> the heads of them. Yeah, that's true. That's true, too. In Revelation 13, you have this power who uh, tells people to worship the first beast and deceives those by the powers that it was given to do, fire coming down out of earth, mark of the beast, etc. That beast is representative of America. We went over this back in January. In Revelation uh, 19, uh, 19 and 20, it's mentioned as the false prophet. So the name changes and it's, yes, it's like more of an individual that is given for this earth beast of Revelation chapter 13. But it has the exact same characteristics and the exact same relationship with the first beast. Now, if you look at, I close my Bible, but if you look at Revelation 19 again, this will be the last because I know we're, it's, it's already late. So I'm, um, I want to respect that. Revelation 19. Uh... In Revelation 19, 19, 19, 19, it says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Now, this is talking about the beast that rises out of the sea in Revelation 13. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which it deceived, etc. So the interesting thing about this is you have the beast, the sea beast, and the kings of the earth and the armies are gathering together. Well, it's interesting because this earth beast is also sort of a king. It is a power. It's not a literal beast. But with this beast, you have these individual powers that are helping that beast. And then you have the earth beast. But the earth beast is named as like an individual power, sort of like a king, except it's a false prophet. The interesting thing about this is that it's no longer called the beast, it's called false prophet. So what does a prophet do? A, a prophet instructs and teaches and, in, and yes, foretells the future. A prophet is the one that it's a position of trust for the people. Now, we have had false prophets in the history and in the Bible, and there's true prophets. The interesting thing is, what this comes to mind is Revelation, as well as Revelation 13, you have this battle among Carmel between the true prophets and the false prophets. True prophets and the false prophets. I think what this is saying, personally, is that it's not necessarily an individual, but it is a power, an entity, that is taking on the role of a false prophet. More than just a political power, now it is a power that's almost taking on a religious tone to it. I think this fits perfect the United States of America. Church and state. And America is a very, very religious nation. Very religious. I remember I went to a seminar at ASU and a guy from England was saying, you know what strikes me about America is that you people are just so religious. <laughs> I'll never forget him saying that. So I think what this is saying is that um, this beast power and this false prophet, there's a very strong religious tone to this. And of course, we, you know, we talked about uh, the connection between religion and civil matters, the state and church. It's dangerous. Anyways. Okay, that'll be. Whatever these powers are, they're not 
powers are, they actually convert. Yeah, well, if you go back to Revelation 13, it's a trinity. It's the dragon who gives all of its power and authority to the sea beast, and then you have the earth beast that backs up everything the first beast is doing, who gets his power from Satan. So they're all together. Okay, why don't we stand up and let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for Revelation 20. It's, uh, I think we sort of scratched the surface, and but we have a, a good idea that, Lord, the saved have such privilege and joy, and there's people that will be lost, unfortunately. And it behooves us, Lord, to be kind and loving and share truth in the best way possible. Lord, uh, we thank you for giving us this information. Help us to believe it and help us to be on your winning side. We thank you for being with us for the blessing tonight. And we pray for a safe trip back to our homes and a good night's rest and another day tomorrow by your grace. We ask these things and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God bless you, everyone. Have a good night.